home. So my name is Shana and I am so excited that you are joining us today um, as we are looking right now um, on doing a series on confident hope. Um, which is really, which is a really awesome time to be talking about confident hope because, as you know, we are in uh, year two of the pandemic, and the one thing that I think we could all use a little bit more now um, is hope. And so we've been looking at how God keeps His promises to us, and how we can have confident hope in those promises um, because He can be trusted to keep, um, you know, to do what He says He's going to do for us. Um, so if you haven't been with us before, uh, we are in week two of a series on Confident Hope. Uh, last week, Pastor Dan shared with us uh, the story of Abraham um, and how if, if when God blesses us, um, he can, if we decide to follow him, he will bless us more um, than we could ever expect. And in turn, our lives will be a blessing to others. And what's been really cool about this series on Confident Hope is that we are looking at um, Hebrews 11, which is what they call the Hall of Faith. And I keep wanting to say Hall of Fame, uh, but, it's, but it's the Hall of Faith. And it is the stories of different people in the Bible and um, just the amazing, um, incredible acts of faith that they have done. And so, you know, when you're joining us today, we are going to be talking about Moses's parents. And maybe for a minute you're like, Moses' parents, not Moses? No. We are going to be focusing on his parents. And, um, you know, maybe uh, you haven't really heard the story of Moses' parents before. You just, you just know a little bit about what Moses has done, um, you know, the parting of the Red Sea and um, setting the Israelites free. But we haven't really talked too much about uh, his family. And um, just a fun fact, uh, when I was growing up, I did not have any um, exposure to this to the story of Moses. Actually, um, my only uh, knowledge of that story came from a uh, Rugrats episode. And I am showing you that I'm a 90s kid because it's a basically it's a cartoon about little kids and um, little babies and how they're defying their parents. And the episode was called let my babies go. And so the babies, uh, Tommy as the main baby is, um, setting the other babies free. And, um, and what's really cool, um, about that is, is that we might know things about Moses, but, and whatever, whatever medium that they're in, but we don't really know the background of his parents and why that matters. Um, and if, and if that's you, I am so glad that you're here with us today because I want to talk about the fact that their actions of what they did for Moses and why they did what they did holds such an important and relevant truth uh, for us today. And that, in fact, their story is not just a prologue uh, to the main event, but that their story itself uh, holds a really relevant um, truth uh, for us. And so it's really important for us to understand a little bit about the background of Moses um, and the story of his parents uh, before we even dive into the story. Um, so just to kind of set the scene for you a little bit. Um, so Mo the story of Moses uh, takes place uh, in the book of Exodus, uh, second book of the Bible. Um, and what's happening is, is that we've got the Israelites and we've got the Egyptians. And the Egyptians, um, there is a king of the Egyptians. His name is Pharaoh. And he is afraid of the Israelites. Like he, like he is scared of them because there are so many of them and they just keep multiplying and growing. And so what he decides to do um, is he enslaves them. And it doesn't, it doesn't really work. It doesn't allay his fears because they keep growing and they keep multiplying. And so he decides to issue this really crushing edict. So he tells all the families, um, all, the, all the Israelite families, that they will need to throw every newborn baby boy into the Nile. They can let the girls live. But all the baby boys have to be drowned um, in the river. 
And so this is the part um, where the story of Moses' parents uh, begin. And so um, if you have a Bible near you, uh, I just would encourage you to take that out. Um, we'll also have the words on the screen as we read um, Exodus 2, uh, verses 1 through 10. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. We see in this story that Moses' parents make great sacrifices for him. You know, can, can you imagine um, having to hide your baby uh, for three months in your house for the fear of being discovered? You know, the story tells us that, you know, Moses' parents had other children. Um, and so not only were they risking themselves, but they were also risking um, his siblings that if they were discovered, they could perhaps all be put to death. And so they make this choice, um, you know, to, to save him, to do everything they can for him. And then when they can't any longer, it kind of reaches a breaking point. You know, the baby, he's getting older, he's three months old, he's, he's probably crying more, and he's a lot harder to hide. You know, they, they make this decision that they're going to put him in the basket um, because they just can't bear uh, to let him die. And um, their actions are what lands them uh, in the Hall of Faith, uh, in the book of Hebrews, specifically about Moses' parents. And it says uh, in Hebrews 11.23, It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. And I want to stop here for a moment and talk about the fact when they, um, about hiding. And so the Hebrew word for hiding um, is a little bit different than maybe we might expect. You know, hiding not in the sense of, you know, just, just moving something aside out of sight, but the way that it's translated is a sense of treasuring and protecting something of great value. You see, in the eyes of Moses' parents, he was valuable to them because they loved him. Not for what he could do for them, but for just who he was. And I think the key point that we could, we could easily miss and that I want to focus on here is this concept of what it means to be valuable. I think in the society that we live in today, we face this internal pressure to feel valuable um, and or to earn our worth. In fact, the definition of worthiness says that we would earn the love or attention we are seeking, that we would be deserving of the love that we look for. And I know that I've felt this, um, and perhaps you. Uh, trying to earn the worthiness, um, to feel worthy of love, whether it's in our family, uh, in friends, uh, maybe with the jobs that we do, to feel that we are earning our worth and that we are deserving of love for what we do. 
And in fact, um, my family and I, we were watching the movie Encanto a few nights ago. And um, if you haven't heard of it, it's this really popular movie on Disney+. Plus. And the whole premise of the story is about a girl who is fighting to feel worthy in her own family um, that, you know, for what, for what she can give to her family. Um, and there's this song called surface pressure and I'm not going to sing it for you. Um, cause I am just a, a terrible singer and, um, you're welcome. Um, but one of, one of the verses in the song says under the surface, I'm pretty sure I'm worthless if I can't be of surface of service. And it resonated with me. It's resonated with so many of my friends. Um, I read articles about it. Um, and a lot of uh, people have been talking about it on social media because I think so many times we judge our own worthiness, you know, based on what we can do for others. Um, and it's, it really affects how we view ourselves. And this can be really dangerous because when we do this, we can easily end up in a constant state of disappointment because it's exhausting. Um, there's really no way to win because there's always something more we can be doing. Um, and the more and more we pursue it, the more that it grows. And it's really easy that if we live this way and if we put hope um, in trying to if we put hope in trying to pursue uh, our, you know, our own worthiness through the acts of what we can do, we can very, very easily uh, lose hope. And as Christians, I find this to be particularly important because I think we all understand that God loves us. Like, you know, we hear it all the time, like God loves you. Jesus loves you. There's so many songs about God's love. And I think that we know it, like we know that God loves us, but I wonder if we, if we question the, if we are worthy of God's love. And perhaps that's why we look to earn our worth in other places. And it can, it can turn into this crisis of worth, you know, even in our church, um, in businesses, in our homes, with our families, you know, how many of us have tried to prove our own worthiness to our children, to our parents, um, to our family, our friends, and to colleagues? And if, if you've ever struggled with this, you know, because, because I certainly have, um, I have really good news to share and it's and I'm just so glad that you're here. Because the story of Moses's parents is relevant because his parents viewed him as worth the sacrifice. They saw him as the treasure to protect and they risked everything to save him. This is what God does for us. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cost was high, right? God is not a God that is far away on the clouds and looking down on us. He was here, right? Like he walked the earth and he sacrificed himself on the cross. He felt pain. He felt suffering. And he died for us. Right? Just like Moses' parents were in it, they risked everything. It is the sacrifice of God, which is precisely which makes us worthy of his love. Rather than anything we could ever do, we become worth the sacrifice because he sees us as worth the sacrifice. You see, God loves us with a sacrificial love because he sees us as worth the sacrifice. 
we become the treasure, not because we are treasure on our own, because we're not, but by his sacrifice, we become precious. As Moses' parents risk everything, so God does the same for us. We can have confident hope in God's love because he keeps his promises. You know, in Romans 5.8, it says, God demonstrates his own love for us. The verse tells us he has already done it. He's kept his promise because he has made the sacrifice. It's finished. The choice to love us, despite great personal cost, can assure us and give us confident hope that we are worthy of God's love. And in fact, our only authority on self-worth should be God. I'm wondering if today you could accept, could you accept that you are worth the sacrifice, that you are worthy of God's love because of who he says you are, because of how much he loves you, that every minute and every hour of your life From the time you're a baby to the time you grow old, you have been worthy every minute of every day of your life. That you are the treasure worth protecting. What would it be like for us or for you, for me, to be free from the pressure to feeling that we have to perform to feel worthy. To not carry the burden that we have to do everything, that we have to be everything, to be loved and to be seen as valuable. To know that you are infinitely loved, not for who you are, not for what you do, but because God sees you as worth it. That you were and you continue to be worth the risk. That you are worth dying for. One of the things that our church has been doing um, has been uh, hope factors. And hope factors are ways that we can put into practice uh, ways to grow our confident hope in God's promises and knowing that he can be trusted to keep those promises. And so I would encourage you this week um, to do um, something uh, specific. So I would just ask you to take out a notebook or a journal, whatever you're doing, and think about one place that you have felt you have tried to put your worth in. And maybe maybe there's lots of places, but for this week, I'm asking you to just think about one. Um, And as you write it down, I want you to take time and write down every single thing that you do that you try to earn your worth. And ask yourself some hard questions. And they're, and they're not easy. As you list, list every one of those tasks, ask yourself if you're doing those things because you want to, because you think they're important, or if you're doing them so that you can feel worthy. And after you list them all, Ask yourself that if you did every single one of those every day, would it really still be enough? I would encourage you to take that list 
and take some time to pray over every single one of those and lay them out before God. And in the prayer, to ask God that every time you have tried to find worth in other places, to pray that God would replace our own expectation of worthiness with his own. Not because of what we do, but because of his love through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me, church? God, I thank you for every single person tuning in today who is listening to this message, God, about the, your promises, that you promise to love us, God, and that you can be trusted to keep your promises, that you've already done it, God. You have sacrificed yourself, God, so that we would know in your eyes we were worth everything. God, sometimes, maybe many times, God, throughout the day, I or in others have tried to place our worth in areas uh, where, where it, it just hasn't been working. God, where we, we feel that if we do more, we be more, God, that we try to fill up our sense of worth, God. And, and maybe we doubt. God, that we are worthy of your love. God, I just pray that you would remind us today that the promise and the hope of the sacrifice, God, and the resurrection of you can tell us that it shows us, God, that we are worth everything, God, that we don't need to look for our worth in other places, but precisely because of what you said you would do, what you said and you did, that we can know that we are the treasure worth protecting and that we are worth everything to you, God. Pray as we go throughout this week, God, we would just be constantly reminded of that every time we do something, God, that we would just be that those thoughts would be replaced with your truth of how much you love us, God, and that we would feel, God, worthy of your love because you said we are. And I just ask this in your name, I pray. Amen. I thank you guys so much for joining us for Sundays at Home. And I hope to see you all in person next week. Um, and I am just so looking forward to it. I love you, church. I'll see you next time.